Good evening. Good evening. Well, instead of uh, Lorraine telling you about her experiences in California and up in the Pacific Northwest, I suppose you'll have to come back again to hear her. <laughs> and uh, I think I'll do a little advertising for her and tell you that it'll be worthwhile you're coming back. <laughs> She really has something important to say. She's had a grand time. <clears throat> but all of us have had out in California a really wonderful time. And above all things, we try to avoid in our work the use of testimonies. And yet, there really isn't any way of talking about the uh, infinite way without testimonies. But these testimonies shouldn't be understood as merely the uh, relating of demonstrations of harmony in one direction or another so much as testimonies to the experience of God and the fruitage of the experience of God because primarily that is the only demonstration that we recognize in the infinite way. If it were possible, if any way could ever be found to demonstrate perfect health or perfect supply or perfect home or perfect companionship without the demonstration of God it really would be a useless procedure because in the history of the world there have been so many millions who have demonstrated all those things and then found when they had them that they really didn't have that which they were seeking Whereas, if a person could demonstrate nothing at all but the presence of God, they would fi find that they would have harmony in every department of their lives in one way or another. So it is then that any testimony, any bearing witness to the fruitage of the infinite way is really bearing witness or testifying to the efficacy of its basic principle and that is demonstrating God as uh, the only presence, the only power, the only law. Now, in our work and through Revelation, we have received the understanding that there is only one reason for the world's discords, individually as well as collectively. There's only one reason for your discords or mine, and that is the sense of separation from God that we entertain because the realization of the presence of God immediately dispels the discords and the inharmonies. And even while in this plane we may not uh, prove this 100%, we very definitely will prove it 80% or 90%, and that's a good demonstration. Now, the object of our work, as you know, is proving that it is possible to experience the presence of God and thereby the presence of harmony in health, supply, human relationships and every other form of uh, daily experience. Therefore, if the infinite way spreads, if the infinite way is accepted outside of the infinite way circle itself 
then to that degree it is proving that it is possible to demonstrate God and by the demonstration of God the demonstration of harmony now you may hear more about these things in detail but I'm just going to as a foundation uh, tell you a few of the experiences of the infinite way in these uh, last six months first of all you know that we were in Japan in October for the introduction of the Japanese translation of the art of meditation and our experience there was a nice one but not in any way a uh, proof that the Japanese people were going to take up the infinite way right away in other words we really accomplished nothing more than the publication of the book itself and a few talks that gave us the opportunity to introduce the subject of meditation as we know it and the principle of demonstrating the presence of God well, of course you know that it was a strange thing to the Japanese people to have an Occidental come over there and talk to them about meditation and I am sure that while we were there they must have been very puzzled about it and wondered why we thought it important to tell them about meditation when they perhaps uh, are one of those races that gave birth to it and of course the principle of spiritual healing was completely foreign to them so there was no sense of uh, their even understanding what we were talking about on that score and yet in these few months so much has happened over there that first of all the art of spiritual healing is in translation an arrangement has been made for its publication number two we were invited to return with expenses paid to Tokyo on, Je on May 10th yesterday to take part in a 10-day conference in three cities on world peace the subject being how to introduce the spirit of God into man now think of that and think of the fact that the infinite day was infinite way has been recognized as carrying that very message that's why the invitation was extended because presumably we know th something about how to introduce the Spirit of God into man the man who translated the Japanese edition has been Consul General of Japan in Burma in uh, Australia and in Hawaiian Islands and is now one of the nine counselors that govern the Japan Defense Agency that is the entire Army Navy and Air Corps of Japan and because I thought that I couldn't make it back to Tokyo so quickly I asked him to represent me at these talks in three cities in Japan and he had to go to his superiors who are the actual heads of the Army, Navy, and Air Corps for permission to speak in three cities on the subject of introducing the Spirit of God into man. <laughs> and I would like you to know that he was given a five-day leave of absence to talk on those subjects so that even the Army, Navy, and Air Corps are willing to acknowledge the need for that on top of that this man oh well the peace treaty does not permit Japan to have a large army navy and air force uh, and so they have to be satisfied with one that will merely protect themselves at home and of course the question is always coming up over there 
of how adequately to defend themselves with so little uh, in the way of defenses and money for defenses. And so the question is always asked over there in the department, how can we best defend ourselves? And they have a magazine in the defense agency. And this man also, the one who translated the art of meditation, has written an article in which he says that one thing they can do in the defense agency, everybody that works for it, can set aside a period every day for meditation. And this period of meditation will do more than an increased allowance for ammunition. We hope to be able to publish that article uh, if we get permission, because I think that it is interesting to see that in a situation of that kind, in a department of that kind, a government department, that there is the recognition the realization that speaking about the spirit of God and man or speaking about meditation for defense is, uh, well, at least it is not ludicrous. It is somewhat intelligent and to be considered. Along with this, our own government has taken just such an, a step and the president has uh, organized this youth peace program, sending groups of uh, young college people, I mean college graduates, workers, into foreign countries. But perhaps you don't know that those workers, before they go overseas, are to receive three weeks of spiritual indoctrination before they go to their tasks. They go on very human tasks. But the government has provided that they receive three weeks of spiritual indoctrination before they go. And while we were in California, the very last day in Riverside, we received the happy word that the 21 who are going to Russia are receiving their spiritual indoctrination in the book, The Thunder of Silence. <laughs> Now, do you remember how many times I have said in tapes, <coughs> lectures, classes, not to be too worried about the world events and the bad news in the news, that behind the scenes something was operating of a different nature? Well, here you have two illustrations of what is operating. Now, I'm sure that with all of Mr. Khrushchev's planning, he hasn't been able to plan a defense against spiritual invasion. <laughs> and here you find not only the United States government, of whom you might in a way expect it, even though it hasn't done it before, but the Japanese government also doing it. <clears throat> and of course we do not fully know how far reaching this may be going, except that we do know this, that a couple of months ago, the Church of England ordered 80 sets of infinite way writings to be sent to 80 chaplains in England, and that the Church of England in New Zealand ordered 14 sets for 14 chaplains in New Zealand. Isn't this a spiritual underground? Isn't this a spiritual invasion taking place in human consciousness. Now remember, we're not fighting enemies with it. Our enemies are not of this world. Our enemies are the principalities of the carnal mind, the lust, greed, and hate in human consciousness. And isn't all of this a spiritual invasion and uh, the many more things beside? Another one. When we were in Los Angeles, the head librarian of the Los Angeles Public Library phoned to me. He said he'd been trying to reach me a couple of days. But the demand for infinite weight books is so large that he has a large order that must be filled immediately. And when the order arrived, it was for 51 copies of 
thunder of silence and 28 of practicing the presence, 28 of art of meditation, 28 art of spiritual healing, and from one to five of all the other titles, in addition to what they already have in their libraries. Isn't this a spiritual invasion into human consciousness? There are so many of these experiences, which I might call testimonies, not testimonies merely to uh, the infinite way, but testimonies to the fact that there is a spiritual invasion taking place. Now, this is even reaching our children. I would like to tell you the experience of a 17-year-old boy who has read the lesson to Sam three times and then writes me two pages of demonstration that has taken place through his, what he calls, learning to talk to God and receive answers. He has talked to God and he has received an answer that resulted in an immediate demonstration of harmony where there had been serious discord. Today in my mail is a letter from a mother. The daughter had an experience and she has been receiving instruction in these, both children have been receiving instruction in this uh, scriptural quotation work. And this daughter had a need of an immediate nature and instantly turned to the first uh, quotation that she had been taught and that she had been practiced and had an immediate demonstration of harmony, an immediate demonstration of God's presence with her. And the brother in school, in an examination, came up against a problem that he couldn't work. It was beyond him. And he turned to the second quotation they had been taught, that I can of my own self do nothing, the Father within me doeth the works. He repeated it to himself a couple of times, and the whole answer was given to him, but the complete answer to that problem. We had the experience of two children who had been taught, started in on these scriptural quotation classes, and... Uh, The entire household, grandmother, grandfather, brother and sister, all came down with a flu as it was passing through Hawaii. And the daughter, realizing that here was an opportunity, turned to her quotation. And the quotation that she remembered was, the place where I stand is holy ground, and if it's holy ground, there's nothing here but God. And she not only healed herself of the flu, but she went right in and healed her grandmother, grandfather, and brother that same hour, restored them and brought them out of bed. I call this an invasion in human consciousness, truth invading human consciousness and demonstrating itself, proving itself. And this, of course, is the ultimate mission of our work, the demonstration of the fact that truth entertained in consciousness is the demonstrated Christ and performs for us. Now, this naturally leads to a point that is most important and more important for metaphysical students than for those in the uh, Protestant world or religious world who are coming to this work. We of the metaphysical world have been so used to the idea of demonstration that when we speak of demonstration, we think in terms of demonstrating money or a house or a marriage or a divorce or uh, something of a temporal nature. And so, <clears throat> when we think of those things, or we think in terms of uh, healing a headache or healing a cancer, and of course, some of these demonstrations are small ones and some of them are large ones. Some of them minor and some are major. But if you understand this message of the infinite way correctly as the demonstration of truth and consciousness, 
you will never again think in terms of demonstrating a thing or a condition or a person and therefore you will never be tempted to think in terms of small demonstrations large demonstrations minor ones or major ones because there's only one demonstration that you have to make if you succeed in demonstrating the consciousness of the presence of God that's your demonstration and it can't be small it can't be large it can't be minor it can't be major it can only be the demonstration of harmony now of course it's true the demonstration of harmony the demonstration of God's presence may do nothing more than remove a headache or simple indigestion or provide us with a ten dollar bill or a seat in the bus or a parking space that's true it may but the mere fact that what we had demonstrated was the omnipresence is what makes it a major demonstration the fact that it met our need of that moment and our need was to our sense a small one is of course beside the point it is true that uh, the healing of a headache is not comparable to the healing of cancer but the demonstration of God's presence would result in the healing of either one if the demonstration of God's presence were really attained not emotionally believed or hopefully wished for so the important point of all these testimonies is this that there is an acceptance taking place of the fact first of all that it is possible to demonstrate omnipresence secondly that the world that part of it which is accepting this is ready to accept the demonstration of omnipresence as its only demonstration and let whatever else may be take place from that in other words if we could demonstrate the spirit of God in man we wouldn't need bigger armies navies and air forces and think of uh, a military setup that is willing to talk about demonstrating the spirit of God in man and the same way when we send people abroad to do the temporal jobs of government think what it means if the government has accepted the principle that these people can be more important if they have spiritual indoctrination in other words again accepting that the spirit of God in man is a greater demonstration than a bigger bomb gotten there first it is remarkable then that in these experiences where we are witnessing the spread of the infinite way what we're really witnessing is the acceptance of the truth that the spirit of God in man realized is the demonstration think what that means when the world can accept that just think what it means if we ourselves could wholeheartedly accept that that there is no other demonstration to be made than the realization of God's presence and then let it fulfill itself at any level of need that there may be if it's to provide us with a horse and buggy let it do it if it's to provide us with an automobile or a seat in an airplane let it do it but let us not concern ourselves with the fruitage of the demonstration but with the demonstration itself and then let the fruitage appear now that really is what we have to offer the world the activity of truth in consciousness the activity of the Christ in consciousness is fulfillment and that with that fulfillment we need not concern ourselves with armies navies and bombs again 
I have seen this coming for quite a few years past. But that is the age we are entering, the age of the recognition of this truth, that our great and only need is the demonstration of omnipresence. And it is for this reason that I have been able to witness all of the discords all around the world and never once have the feeling that we're on the brink of disaster. Always I've had this feeling that behind all of this outer parade there is something working in human consciousness and you remember I quoted Emerson on that, that the dice of God are always loaded. In other words, that always in back of the scene there is something operating. And it isn't, I mark this well, it isn't that always there has been something operating behind the scene, or no. No. And it isn't that this would operate behind the scene now of its own accord. No. It is only in the degree that there are those working daily, hourly, to realize within themselves this omnipresence, that this experience can take place universally. In other words, don't think for a moment that this harmony on earth or peace on earth or prosperity on earth would come about or would have come about of its own accord. Oh no. There is nothing ever to stop mortal mind operating, the carnal mind, until the realized Christ is made manifest. Without that, error could keep on for another thousand years, another five thousand years. There could be more wars and still more wars, more poverty and still more. There could be more slavery throughout the world than there ever has been before. There's nothing to stop it. The only thing that ever stops the inertia, the keeping right on, keeping on of error, the only thing that ever stops it is when the conscious, realized Christ takes place. Now, you prove this in this way. If you are ill, <clears throat> what is to stop that illness continuing until eventually it results in death? Well, temporarily there may be some form of materia medica stop it. But until we come to one in which there is no recourse to materia medica, and then what do you do? Well, then it just keeps right on keeping on until it uh, brings the grave. But there is something that stops it, and every one of you who ever have, who any one of every one of you who have ever had metaphysical healings knows that when you come up to a practitioner who attains the experience of the realized Christ, your disease disappears or your lack, or your sin, or whatever it may be, false appetite. In other words, all that constitutes a practitioner is an individual who attains some measure of realized Christ, some measure of God's presence, some measure of omnipresence. The very moment that one individual appears with a measure of realized Christ, 10,000 people can be healed by the one. It makes no difference if it was Jesus or in lesser degree the disciples or in our century Christian science or unity or new thought or infinite way. Wherever you came upon a practitioner with some measure of realized Christ, it made no difference which movement it was. What counted was that individual of realized Christ and the error was stopped. The healing took place. Now, once we realize that, that any form of discord, personal, individual, or collective, can be eradicated 
by the attainment of this spiritual consciousness, of this activity of truth of Christ in consciousness, then that becomes our goal. Our goal isn't to get healthier. Our goal isn't to get wealthier. Our goal isn't even to get happier. You know, one of the reasons so many of the ministers uh, used to complain about uh, Dr. Peel and his uh, system of right thinking was that so much stress was on right thinking and gaining happiness and so forth. Gaining peace of mind and gaining peace of soul and peace of something else. Whereas the church thought that there were higher goals than just attaining those things and the church is right in that regard. The church is right. Just attaining some kind of peace temporarily isn't a high goal. Attaining happiness is no kind of a goal. But attaining that which ensures happiness, that which makes happiness in all of its phases and forms a reality, that is the great attainment. So it is that every acceptance of the infinite way, whether by a government or by a church, or by a metaphysical movement, as we have been witnessing this past years. Every acceptance of it is an acceptance of the principle that the goal of life is attaining conscious realization of God, conscious oneness with God, conscious union with God, and then finding that that is the spiritual presence or force or power that was predicted for this age. In other words, when we were told that in this age the secret of spiritual power would be revealed, this is it. The secret of spiritual power is Christ realized, Spirit realized, Buddha realized, God realized, Emmanuel, if you like it. I like that word, Emmanuel. It seems to give me a feeling because of its uh, translated meaning, God with us. I don't know what the, the word Emmanuel of itself has no meaning to me because I don't know its language, but its English translation is God with us. And so that word has always, since I'm in this work, been important to me, Emmanuel, because just to be able to say Emmanuel, even though it has no meaning to me, I get the feeling, ah, yes, God is with us. And in that feeling of Emmanuel, we have the same thing as we have in the term omnipresence, or word omnipresence. Just think of the word omnipresence and what it means. And then you'll see that our entire infinite way teaching is attaining omnipresence. Nothing else. Because in the attainment of Emmanuel, or God with us, we can then be just like Moses. If we come to a Red Sea, the very fact of Emmanuel will open it. If we come to lack, the very fact of Emmanuel will bring manna from the sky or ravens bringing food or the multiplication of loaves and fishes. Spiritual power, then, has nothing to do with power. It has to do with realization. It isn't a power that we use or are ever going to use to destroy anybody with or anything. We aren't going to overcome communism with it. We aren't going to overcome armies and navies with it. When we attain omnipresence, all presence, there'll be nothing else present but that presence. All else will be dissolved, dissipated. So, for our own individual experience then, let us not forget, ever, when we sit down to pray, when we sit down to treat, when we sit down to meet a problem for ourselves or anyone else, let's be sure that we throw that problem out the window. That's not going to be easy for beginners, but it should be easy for you. It should be, because by now you know 
that if you do attain that presence, you have no other demonstration to make. Whereas you certainly know by past experience that if you were to demonstrate your health tomorrow or demonstrate your supply tomorrow, you'd have to do it next month again. There is no such thing as demonstrating anything permanently. But if you demonstrate omnipresence, you've demonstrated that which only has to be demonstrated once, because from then on, you can say with Paul, I live yet not I. Now this presence lives my life. Now this presence is the substance of all form. This presence is the law. Ah, more than that. Once we have realized omnipresence, we can say, I no longer live by law, but by grace. This presence goes before me to make the crooked places straight. This presence walks beside me. This presence is the substance. It's the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water. I am the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water. I am the resurrection. This presence that we have demonstrated, that we now consciously feel within ourselves, this is the demonstration. Now, I've told you in classes that as I sit here meditating with you, or if some have asked me for help and I meditate for them, that my thought never goes to the person or to the problem. The fact that they have asked for help establishes the contact with my consciousness. But from then on, it is only necessary that I realize the spiritual presence, activity, law, whatever you want to call it. And if I do that, the need is full, the need is met. Whatever is necessary is fulfilled. And in this way, it is fulfilled very often in ways that I have no way of knowing and that the patient had no way of knowing, in far different way than it could have planned itself. So it is then that you should be able to see that when you sit down to meditate or treat, that you must leave every problem outside of your thinking and be sure that you come to God pure of heart, that is, with only desire to know him aright. The only desire to tabernacle with God, to commune with God, to feel that presence within. And then be satisfied. And if you meditate a few minutes, even if you don't feel anything, don't be concerned because God is not an emotion and it isn't necessary that we feel anything. It does so happen that at times we do feel something, but it isn't necessary. This week, I've had just one experience uh, in the nature of feeling. I was sitting with a patient and student, and all of a sudden, it seemed out of my heart there rushed something, gushed something. Uh, it was just uh, like a load of love. Now, it wasn't personal because I hadn't uh, impelled it. I mean, it was no conscious thing. Something just jumped up and out, and uh, I could feel it. Just a load of love went by. Okay? But that doesn't happen often because... God is not an emotion. As a general rule, I warn our students, be careful about emotion, because usually if there is emotion present, there's God absent. Emotion can be a stumbling block to it. That's why we have no music with our work. There's nothing wrong with music. And don't think I don't like music, because I do. But I couldn't have it around our work, because music, and especially certain kinds of music, and more especially religious music, is stimulating to the emotion. And it brings up some kind of a false confidence in something that's going to do something. And if you ever get that, you're lost spiritually, because there isn't going to be anything to do anything. God already is and is doing. 
Anything that stimulates the emotion, even that stimulates faith, is wrong. What do we want of faith? The sun's going down. I don't need any faith to know that it's coming up tomorrow. And actually, I don't need any faith to make it come up tomorrow. It'll come up tomorrow without any faith on my part. And I have learned this, that God functions perfectly without any faith on my part. No lack of faith on my part could stop God operating. And no amount of faith that I could generate would make God operate. The fact is, God is. And God is functioning. And it doesn't take any emotion to make God do it. And it doesn't take any emotion to arouse me to receive it. I know just as sure as two times two or four that God is functioning. And if there is some specific lack of God in my experience, it has nothing to do with God. It has to do in some way with my violating the karmic law of as ye sow, so shall ye reap, or fulfilling the karmic law, and I've just been sowing the wrong thing and be sure I'm reaping it. Now, it has nothing to do with God, and don't think God's going to set aside my wrongdoing. No. God doesn't forgive us our sins. There's no forgiveness for our sins, except the, the forgiveness that comes within ourself when we have realized our sin and dropped it. The thief on the cross was forgiven, not by God. No. The moment he turned to the master in the realization of his previous wrongs, he was forgiven. It all took place within himself. The God, God doesn't forgive the woman taken in adultery. How is he going to forgive the crime of adultery? Will you tell me? God doesn't forgive the crime of adultery. But the moment the adulterer looks up and says, Oh, oh, Father, in that instance he's forgiven. And the whole experience is wiped out. Why? That's the nature of this law that is operating within us that the penalty only lasts while the sin itself lasts. Once we've come to the realization of our sin, the sin's gone and the penalty's gone because though our sins were scarlet, we were white as snow. The only thing that could make us scarlet again was repeating it. And in that case, we're warned, be careful lest the worst thing comes upon you if you go back to the same state of consciousness you were in. So it is then that we don't need emotion to experience God. All we need is this realization. God is. God in the midst of me is. God is closer to me than breathing because of omnipresence. Because of omnipresence, omnipotence is the truth. Only one law is operating, one power is operating, one being, one presence, one cause, and therefore there can only be one effect. Now, it doesn't take any emotion because you can't move God with emotion any more than you can move God with bribery or by sacrifices. Now, the Hebrews were full of sacrifices, but the Master warned them, God has no pleasure in your sacrifices. God has no pleasure in your asceticism. And believe me, God isn't moved by any appeals, emotional or otherwise. And the reason is, whatever it's God's function and nature to be and to do, that's what God is being and doing. And therefore, we can't increase God's presence and power, we can't decrease God's presence and power, but we can inwardly relax in our own inner assurance where I am God is, omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience, this is the truth of being. And then, relaxing in that word. Relaxing in that and going out about our business and doing it. And without watching that which we have called the enemy, the problem, dissolves. 
disappears. Do you see now, and of course as you go back to the writings, you'll wonder how it is that you didn't see it on every page, that all there is to the message of this infinite way is this realization of omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience. And of course out of that comes our second major principle, but it's only an offspring of, of the first, and that is the nature of error as a universal claim. Not personal, but universal. In other words, there is, that's why we can forgive sin, by healing it. And the only reason we have as great a success as we do is because we're not personalizing it, pinning it on the adulteress or the thief and then saying, now let's see what we can do to reform them. Not at all. We absolve them right from the beginning in the realization that it never was a personal sin any more than the sin that Paul felt. Paul says he knows that he's a good man, yet he feels a sense of sin in him. Not that he's sinful, I oh know, but this universal sense of sin is still around. And I guess as long as uh, we're in the flesh, we'll all be able to say, I know, I know I've gotten past the place of sinning or desiring to sin and yet temptation does stick around sometimes and I feel it but the handling of it through the infinite way is the handling of it not as a personal sin or personal false appetite or desire but as a, a carnal mind the arm of flesh or the universal belief in two powers and thereby impersonalizing it and nothing rising now, the thing is, that all of this is true, and all of this is truth, but that none of it is going to be operative in the experience of any of us, except in proportion of our knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It is true that temporarily you'll go to a practitioner and the practitioner's awareness of the truth will free you, but that's only a temporary thing. It's not a permanent relationship because the next time it has to be done again and again and again until ye know the truth. Then is when you begin to bring about the permanent dissolution of error, when you yourself know this. Therefore, it takes the activity of truth in consciousness it takes truth individually entertained in consciousness to dispel these illusions of the material senses. Therefore, the degree in which we entertain truth determines the degree of our permanent harmony. As in the cases that I've illustrated with these children, it was the activity of truth at that specific moment in their consciousness that made their immediate demonstration of harmony. But remember this, that if we were to go on just waiting for a problem to come up and then knowing some truth to dispel it, we'd be living in the realm of demonstration forever. Whereas our function is not to wait for the devil to pop up before we say, get thee behind me, Satan, but to prepare ourselves that the devil never comes to us. In other words, the activity of truth in our consciousness changes our consciousness. Now, you will discover as you come into the study and the uh, demonstration of the mystical consciousness you will discover that your natural consciousness is not the mystical consciousness. The mystical consciousness is not your natural consciousness. Now the mystical consciousness is that which Paul referred to when he said, I live yet not I, Christ liveth my life. In other words, spiritual consciousness or mystical consciousness is now living my life. So that, 
as long as you have the human mind and you are working with truth, what you are doing is you are having the truth destroy your human mind, your natural consciousness, and build for you or unfold and reveal, disclose to you this mystical consciousness which is hidden in every one of us. It's called the Son of God. It was implanted in every one of us upon our creation. When? Billions of years ago, when we were created as coexistent with God, as we came into expression as an individual offspring of God, there was included in our being this mystical consciousness which is hidden by the Adamic belief in two powers. And as long as we're entertaining this belief in two powers, our mystical consciousness remains hidden. Through our metaphysical and spiritual study and practice, the mystical consciousness comes into uh, experience slowly, gradually, a grain at a time. So that in these preparatory years, what we are doing with the activity of truth and consciousness is really dissolving our mortal consciousness, dying daily is Paul's term for it, and at the same time we are being reborn of the spiritual or mystical consciousness. The spiritual consciousness is being raised up in us, lifted up, unfolded to us, disclosed to us, until eventually there is enough of this mystical consciousness so that instead of living by the laws of matter or even the laws of mind we're beginning now to live by grace instead of living by taking thought even right thinking even true thinking we're living automatically now by this degree of developed spiritual consciousness, even without taking thought for what we shall eat or drink, without uh, treatment or specific prayer for it. So then, the entertaining of truth and consciousness, whether we read it, whether we hear it, or, and of course this is the greatest activity, being in the presence of those who have evolved a step ahead of us, all of this, is the dying daily to our mortal consciousness and the being reborn of this spiritual center, spiritual consciousness, and the gradual taking over by it until we come to Paul's statement that now I live but yet not I. Now it's not I living. Now it is this mystical consciousness which is living as me and it goes before me, it prepares mansions for me, it uh, performs that which is given me to do, it is the source of my bread, meat, wine and water, it is the all in all to my experience. When we understand this, we will understand why it is that in this age it is not going to be necessary to bring every person in the world into truth. It's not going to be necessary to proselyte. It's not going to be necessary to say, well now, after we get all the metaphysicians on this side and then all of the Protestants and then some of the Catholics and some of the Hebrews, well by that time we'll have 51% on our side, by then we ought to prevail. No, I might as well tell you now that that is not going to be for the simple reason that before you can get 51% of this generation into truth, they will all have passed on by reason of three score years and 10 or 20, and you'll have a new generation to start all over working with. No, that isn't going to happen, and it isn't necessary to happen. What one Moses could do for his Hebrew people, what one Jesus could do 
for his people and those who came after him. What one Mrs. Eddy could do in bringing spiritual healing into the consciousness of the world, that's what one group of people can do today. They don't have to wait for everybody to be reformed. All that we have to do is attain this consciousness ourselves and then we find a government over there doing it and a government here doing it and a church here doing it and a church there doing it and we'll find that it's no longer one by one it's now 10,000 by 10,000 you see that the reason is this there is only one consciousness and therefore in the degree that any one of us is lifted up we are automatically drawing up to us everyone within range of us. See that? So it is then that we don't have to worry about bringing the world into this. If we bring ourselves into it, the world is coming into it. As you can see, we can't go to Washington and be a part of the government. They wouldn't have us. Or to Tokyo. Or to Russia. But see how well we're represented we are. <laughs> and yet, not one of them would recognize the name Infinite Way or Goldsmith. Do you see that? But you have to be very careful that you don't want credit. That all you want is to see Christ realized in consciousness. And then if by chance somebody pops up tomorrow and gets all the medals, well, that's all right. It's just like Mr. Shepard. He got a medal. And all the people who contributed to that had to stand by and watch him go off with the medal, which he couldn't have gotten without all of those who contributed to it. Do you see that? And so it is. We may never get monuments built for us, but be sure of this, that that's not the object of our work. The object of our work, first of all, is to reveal that Christ realized in consciousness is the salvation of the world and then to demonstrate it for our own individual experience not for the world and then all of a sudden pick up the paper and see it being realized here there and the other place well you see this trip to California and uh, a couple of months before that in Hawaii, brought all of this so-called demonstration to light. And with every mail, more and more evidence is coming in that the seeds that we have planted in our little journeys around, in our little gatherings together like this, this seed is bearing fruit. And I don't mind telling you that I really believe that 21 people going to Russia with the thunder of silence is a demonstration of God's <laughs> presence and of God's grace. I do think so. And uh, I think that the Los Angeles Public Library calling for a uh, hundred and some odd books is at one time is a demonstration of a spiritual invasion. I think that all of these children beginning to work with these Bible now, the Bible quotations have been there now for 400 years that the book's been printed. And look at the fruitage when children are taught how to work with them and have them in consciousness. And that's why I understand what the Hebrews meant way back in the olden days. Write it on your forehead, bind it on your arm, and then put it on the gate post of your house so that no matter where you turn, you can't lose the word of God. And I feel that way too. Pray without ceasing. Keep this word of God in consciousness from waking. It's all the way back in the book, The Infinite Way. From waking in the morning to sleeping at night and even waking up in the night. Keep this word in consciousness and then watch the fruitage as it comes forth. And so I think that now after 30 odd years, I'm beginning to see a little fruitage on a greater scale than just personal.